Welcome to Commissioner's Corner. I'm your host, Lois Leonard, and thanks for joining us. The phrase climate change is heard so often, one might become immune to the impact the word should have. Our goal today is to make sure that doesn't happen. What is the city doing today that is making a difference and what will it do tomorrow? Speaking with us is Boston's Chief of Environment, Energy and Open Space, Reverend Mariama White Hammond. Her department protects our air, water, climate, and land resources. Let's have a great discussion and see how we can all make a difference. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Chief. Wonderful to have you here today. Thank you, it's good to be with you. We, I'd like to start with talking about a recent show that we recorded. We interviewed with uh, Commissioner Woods of the Parks and Recreation Department, and he discussed the number of trees that Boston has. And for a city, it seems like quite a large number. How, how does the tree canopy protect our environment? Yeah, so we do have um, a lot of trees. We've taken the time, particularly with the street trees, to be able to inventory all of them. But the truth is that we'd actually love to have even more trees. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of times we see the trees there and we don't really notice all of the ways that they're supporting us. So um, obviously there, there's a, there's the shade that they offer. Um, we've had more and more hot days. And so um, I, I don't know, I'm a runner and I, I have had a few experiences when you, when you start your run a little too late and then you're out there in the heat and you're just like so thankful when you run past, you know, sort of a block of trees that help to make it just a little bit easier to do that run. So they, they provide a shade that's really important. Um, the other thing is that when you have blocks of trees actually together, like in Franklin Park, um, those trees actually serve as a cooling for the entire neighborhood around them. Um, trees do sweat a little, and especially when they're in those in those sort of large collections together, um, they're really actually able to to sort of move the the wind and the air and the temperature in the area to be to be cooler. Um, so they play that important function there. Obviously, they also you know sort of recycle the carbon dioxide we bring out, breathe out, and make sure that we have more oxygen available to us, um, and sort of really keep the air a lot cleaner. So they, they they play a lot of important roles, and I also just think that like spiritually, there's an importance to having nature around you. I think we all have that experience of like having a a room when you add a plant to it something kind of shifts um and so i think that there's there, the trees are playing an important role um and it is hard in the in the urban landscape to find places to to put trees um, i think people probably don't think about it but there's all sorts of like cables and um, lines going under the ground and so making sure that we also make sure that there's enough space for our trees particularly in our streets um and to really look at some of our neighborhoods are, 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 have a very low tree canopy. So you have neighborhoods like Hyde Park and West Roxbury, which have a significant um, proportion of trees, and that's really important. They play an, an important role. Then you have neighborhoods like uh, Chinatown, or even the neighborhood that I live in, in Dorchester, um, where we have many fewer trees, and that leads to um, much higher concentrations of heat and also, um, you know, the trees are not able to do some of the, the cleaning of the air and the pollution. So on, on my walk to the train in the morning, I can literally, uh, during the winter, taste the pollution coming off of 93. It's kind of bad. wonderful. You actually With, mentioned that your department did an inventory of the trees recently. Um, what, what were the findings? Anything significant from that inventory that you found to be interesting? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So one, we did see an inequity in where trees are distributed across the city. And that, that inequity um, unfortunately aligns with a lot of Boston's painful past around histories of race and class and where we made decisions um, to beautify communities and where we didn't make those decisions. Decisions that were made decades ago. Right? In many cases, yeah. Yes. So the question for us is, what do we do now how do we remedy that situation? As I said, trees play all of these important roles. And so if we know that they have these important health benefits, if we know that they have this, these important environmental benefits, what are we doing to make sure that every single one of our uh, residents has access? So that, that inequity of distribution was key. We also now know what kinds of trees we have planted. Um, and that's really important. So this, this year we, um, have found that the em emerald ash borer, which is an invasive bug, it's really actually a pu beautiful, like sparkly green bug. I was the emerald ash borer. Pretty bit dangerous. This year. <laughs> yeah, 
it's yeah. pretty, but yeah, exactly. We we would actually prefer that it not be here. Um, and and because of the tree inventory, at least on the street trees, we know exactly where our ash trees are. We know exactly um, which trees we need to monitor for health and which trees we need to inoculate. So having that kind of inventory is really um, helpful in being able to care for our trees and to be able to pay attention which trees are doing really well and maybe we should be doing more of, but also to make sure that we don't overplant of any one kind of tree. Um, so because our inventory of trees, of ash trees is not terribly high, we have about um, 18, one, 1,817 uh, ash trees, we know that. Um, because of that, um, Obviously, we don't want to lose any trees, but by keeping our, our tree canopy diverse, we are ensure that no one pest can take out um, the entri entire canopy. So we learned a, a lot, um, and, and the question now is how do we increase that canopy? Where do we um, have opportunities to do better? Well, you've uh, great efforts um, from your department with the urban forest plan. I'm sure with having to cut down some of those ash trees and since the count is low, you'll have to, you'll want to replant some more of the same, I assume. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we, we anticipate we're probably going to lose at least 200 in our street trees and there, there are more. We, we'll want people to be looking at the trees in their yard. Um, we're going to be looking at trees in parks and other sorts of things. Um, but we will not be replanting ash. <laughs> we do okay. like that. We will um, be looking at some other trees that um, have a similar sort of function and, and aesthetic to them um, uh, until the emerald ash borer is sort of more determinately gone. You know, your department has such a broad, broad reach. Um, <laughs> historic preservation also falls under the umbrella of the environmental department. So how do those two intersect? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, there's one piece that I can just say, I think it, it is an artifact of sort of historically, um, there was a point where they called us uh, the cabinet of misfit toys. Like we had a, <laughs> we have a lot going on. Cause I do, we do, I have everything from archeology span to animal control, pretty different um, um, functions. But you know, one of the important pieces around Boston is a historic city. It, it, it has um, been at the forefront of really looking at issues of history, um, people come from all around the world to uh, look at the American Revolution and and to you know visit Faneuil Hall and to, you know there's there's lots. I think one of the challenges for us, and I think this is true from a climate perspective and our open, there are so many things to celebrate, and we need to do some of that with a critical eye because there's certain stories in Boston that have been told well and extensively, and there are other stories that have been left out. We have not told the full history of the city. Um, we have not talked fully about the contributions of women or people of color. We've not looked as actively as we can um, with folks with disabilities and the roles that they've played. Um, you know, the, an interesting story that I learned is uh, uh, one of the first uh, campaigns to, to, do, to uh, uh, encourage vaccination was by Mather, and he learned about it um, because one of his slaves um, sort of talk to him about the way that they were doing, you know, sort of an early form of vaccination in West Africa. So these are stories that like people don't really know. Right. Um, and so we have a responsibility to, um, as we go into the future, as we address climate change, as we try to reimagine the city, how do we also tell a fuller story about who we are? How do we make sure that sites that, um, maybe have not gotten the kind of national attention that they deserve are, are elevated. So an example is um, the Shirley Eustis house. I went to the Shirley Eustis house as a kid. I think a lot of us who grew up in the city went there as a, you know, like there was a field trip and you learned about it. And it's one of the few remaining, you know, colonial governor ma governor's mansions in the country. Um, but down the street, um, there is also what used to be a barn attached to the, to the, farm, which was really a plantation. Um, and that's where a lot of um, slaves were rumored to have lived. Um, and I didn't know that. I didn't know that um, some of the slaves of, the, of um, Governor uh, Shirley were baptized at King's Chapel, which is on the, you know, 
American revolutionary, you know, sort of history and people know about it. Um, so the, the, the work we need to do to uncover that, to tell a, a fuller story that includes all of us, um, I think is an important part of what our cabinet is about. So when I mentioned that your department has a broad reach, I wasn't kidding. I think no. what we should do is show it's alone. cemeteries in our this. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Well, um, we have a lot to cover. Let's let's talk about carbon neutral by 2050. That that's a quote phrase that uh, we we've, we've been hearing for a while. So carbon neutral by 2050 is that possible? Is is the city of Boston going to be able to do that? It's not just possible. It's absolutely necessary. Because the reality is, um, what climate change is telling us is that. Right now, we're using up the resources that should be for our children, for generations to come, and we're leaving them the bill. We're burning up all this carbon, we're putting it in the atmosphere, and then, we'll, then, we're, then we're saying, well, somebody's going to have to figure that out. Being carbon neutral by 2050 is to say we cannot keep passing the buck to future generations. Now. To be honest with you, the science tells us we should be moving even faster than that. But um, we are setting that as a clear goal. We're excited to see that um, some of the countries, not all of them, but some of the countries that, that um, the COP26 UN Climate Conference are also taking on that goal. Um, and so that is the bare minimum we need to do. It's not about just saving the planet. It's about making sure the planet is actually habitable for all of us. Um, the planet's going to survive. She'll figure out, you know, even if it goes back to whatever it was like during the dinosaurs, the planet will still be here, right? The question is, will this be a planet that human life can flourish and thrive on? And um, being carbon neutral by 2050 is the floor. So the key is everybody sets the goal. Um, and then we celebrate and not as many times have we actually started digging in to do the work. So um, we just um, pass an ordinance. Um, you know, people are calling it affectionately Birdo 2.0, um, you know, uh, building emissions reporting and disclosure ordinances is, is, is what it's, uh, it actually stands for, but most of us just call it Birdo um, for short. And it basically says we have to chart a path for all buildings over 20,000 square feet how are you going to get to carbon neutral by 2050? And we're going to hold you accountable in five-year increments to get there. Um, and, and here's what I believe. First of all, New York has already passed it. And I believe that if New York can do it, Boston can do it too. You can't tell me that they can do anything that we can't, <laughs> that we can't do it. I think um, our um, ordinance is known for being a little bit more groundbreaking um, because we looked at what other folks had done and tried to um, improve on it, learn from, you know, sort of, some of the critiques and concerns that they have. But I, I, I have every faith that um, communities, that real estate organizations, that cultural institutions, if we come together, if we put our heads together, we have some of the best minds out there. We can figure out how to get there. And what we've done is really said to people, here's the schedule so you know exactly where you need to be every five years. Now let's marshal the, uh, the innovation that we need to get there. I understand the building piece of it and the expectations um, are there, but let's talk about another strategy. Let's talk about transportation. Mm -hmm. What is, you know, which is something that hits most of us all in a very personal way, you know, giving up your car and biking to work isn't always the solution for everyone. So um, almost 30% of Boston's emissions uh, do come from transportation. And some of that should naturally go away as electric cars become a more of a mainstream and come on board. But what else needs to happen in order to cut these those transmission uh, transportation emissions? Yeah, so there's some things we can do in this as the city. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if you saw our newest bus uh, rapid um, lines in the middle of the street on Columbus Avenue have just just opened this week. So that's exciting. Um, that's I have, gonna I'm going to go drive by there today. Yes. <laughs> and it will make it faster for people to get in. We've got to make okay. public transportation as accessible as possible. Um, and that will mean, I know this is hard for people to hear, 
making public transportation more accessible will mean making cars more challenged. And it's gonna be a little bit of a, a, of a transition. People have been used to getting in their cars and using that to move around. But if you're gonna prioritize um, public transportation, you also have to deprioritize cars. The other layer to that is um, only about 20% of our trans transportation emissions in the city of Boston are from trips that originate in the city of Boston. Okay. 80% of it is people commuting outside. into Boston from outside. So we have to have a regional strategy because if we got all of our people to get on bikes and ride the bus and take the train, it wouldn't be it enough. not reduce emissions enough. That doesn't mean that our people don't need to do that because there are some other pluses. When we take the trains and when we bike, we also get the exercise that we need because we also have a bit of obesity crisis in the country. So there's some other big pluses, um, but we do have to have a regional approach um, because so if a lot of work our needs suburban to, neighbors to shift. A lot of work needs to be done, not just within our city, but our city officials um, need to be working with the entire state officials. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I'd like to talk about climate change for just a minute, um, because as you mentioned earlier, I don't think it's my imagination. The temperatures are getting warmer. Uh, it, it certainly felt that way this summer. And it's great to hear about the shade that our tree canopy offers us, but how is Boston getting ready for climate change and getting climate ready? Yeah, so I mean, I've grown up in the city my whole life. The example I use, you know, that reminds me most starkly is I remember as a kid, you'd always want to wear your favorite summer outfit to school. And I remember I would, I would, you know, my, my you know, my parents always we had like uniforms. It's like the, the fall wear was never as good as the summer wear. <laughs> and I remember most years, my mother would tell me like, that's just not going to happen. And most years she would win. Mm -hmm. And now I wear summer clothes into October. Oh yeah. So Sandals it is stay on pink. until Columbus day. Oh, and you're just, you know, it's crazy. Right. So I think, um, you know, we had our hottest year ever so far this year. Um, we saw days in the 90s in May. Um, and so there's some practical things we're doing. So for instance, in the parks department, which I oversee, we are um, starting to open up our water features more around Memorial Day, whereas we used to do it around June 15th. That was a good solid day, but because of climate change, we're moving that up a couple of weeks. Um, so that, you know, our water features are ready in time for the first heat wave. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is like the environment department um, partnered with the uh, mayor's office of new urban mechanics and the Boston public library to do some cooling spots this year. It was really fun to go see them. They were often planted right in front of the, um, one of the libraries and they were just, you know, tents and spaces so you could sit outside and read, but we also had these misters. And I remember we were out there sort of looking at them officially. And this woman walked by, she was pushing the carriage and she had our younger child. And um, it was a, it was a hot day and she walked by and she just helped the mist. And I saw her back the carriage back up just to get a little bit more time in that mist. Um, and so we're going to have to have those kinds of interventions. What are our hottest neighborhoods? Where are there spaces that people would be exposed? Um, how do we make sure we have ways of, of cooling them down? We also have to think about a lot of our essential workers who work outside. Um, um, we've been yes. thinking a lot about some people, particularly in the parks department, all during the pandemic, the parks department was working hard. Um, our staff never got to, you know, sort of go home and work from a computer, right? And the maintenance staff was out there keeping things going. It's exciting and important, and we're glad to provide that service, but we also have to pay attention can't have staff out on 90 degree days doing the same amount that they would be able to do on a 70 degree day, for instance. And so we're thinking at all of those levels, how do we um, have interventions that protect people? Um, we are doing what we can to, to mitigate climate change, to um, you know, reduce the, the sort of negative impacts. The reality is that climate change is here already and we have to do everything we can um, to prepare. So heat is just one thing. The other thing is many of our parks that are being redesigned are be, are also water management systems. We've got cisterns in them. So you might just see a baseball field, but underneath it, there might be a cistern that we're using to protect the city from flooding, flooding some of our parks that are right on the water, like Mokley Park. Um, we'd be look, we're looking at sea level rise. 
But there's other parks and other parts of the city where we're also trying to pay attention to flooding. So um, we're trying to prepare to, to reduce the impact of what's coming, but also to prepare because climate change is, is certainly here already. So can something good come from this? Um, I'm thinking, is it possible uh, for the city to have something good come from this by creating new jobs? Is that happening? Or are we hoping yeah, so that to happen? It is happening. And um, you know, we have a green jobs initiative here in the environment department. Um, we've been working closely with the Office of Workforce Development, which has already been doing some work around green jobs. And we're really trying to figure out how together we can amplify, accelerate. We announced about a week and a half ago now, it's, I tell you, so much happens in a week here. Sometimes I can't even remember how, but um, we announced um, a, a new program that we will be replicating from Philadelphia. It's called Power Core, and it trains young people, 18 to 30, um, young people who, um, are not college engaged, young people who may have graduated from high school or have a GED, but do not have a career path. And what we do is spend a year getting them on the path to the jobs that are open and, and vacant and available now. So there was actually just an article that came out that said, the state has set these ambitious goals, but we don't have the workers to do the work. And if we don't make sure people are trained um, to fill these roles, we won't get there. So this is about training young people, particularly young people who are formerly um, in the criminal justice system, young people who may just have gotten off track to do things like tree maintenance, right? Um, we are we looking have for those beetles, requests. those bad beetles in the ash. I know, <laughs> exactly. Can we be training young people to do tree inoculations to protect our trees? Um, can we, we have urban wilds. More, more communities have tried to protect pieces of land that we're calling our urban wilds. We don't have the staff to maintain them. Could we be training a crew of young people to maintain those spaces, but also be ready to go into um, the private sector around trees, uh, and tree maintenance. We're also looking at green stormwater infrastructure and what can we do to support um, the Boston Water and Sewer Commission and the Mass Water Resources Authority. They're about to have a, a large group of people retire and they need the next generation of, of young people to be looking in those directions. So it's actually exciting when, obviously I wish climate change wasn't happening. That would be my first choice. Mm -hmm. But given that it is happening, the fact that we have an opportunity to train young people and particularly young people who have not always um, been on a real career path, young people who have had a tendency to be in sort of dead end jobs, the fact that we could train them in the kinds of jobs that you can work hard, come home, feed your family, um, that's exciting. Um, and we're really fact, focused on environmental justice communities. How do we take the communities that have suffered the most and get them engaged and be the ones that are turning this around? And recently there was actually uh, a conference that focused on green jobs. And I think we're gonna take just a moment right now and share some video from that conference. We are not looking towards climate change, we are experiencing it right now. And it will only get worse. And so we are here not just because climate change is real, but because there are folks in our city who are struggling. There are young people who I've known my whole lives that find themselves on career tracks that are dead end. And those same young people find themselves living in South Bay or being pushed to other parts of the state because they cannot afford to stay in the city that they grew up in and love. Really looking forward to working together with everyone here to make sure that green jobs happen not just in general, but that we put at the front of the line those young people who our city owes the opportunity to show what they can do. And we look forward. Right now, the tree division is out there mm -hmm. answering calls. That's right. If you have a call about a tree, please call 311. Mm -hmm. They're out there answering these calls. But currently, we have to hire contractors from other parts of the state to come help us. This time next year, it is my sincere hope that our own young people will be out responding, being able to work in their neighborhoods, providing the service and support we need to be the kind of resilient city that we are and that we will need to be even more 
in the years to come. Thank you. Uh, Chief, recently, um, President Biden returned from Scotland where he attended a global climate conference. Can you share your thoughts? Do you, do you think this was effective? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I am also participating in the um, climate conference. I'll be there with um, uh, Secretary Theo Herides from the state and other folks really looking at um, how do we take those big pledges and um, make them um, real. I think it's important, um, one, that the world comes together because we will suffer together um, with climate change. And so we should be having that dialogue. And it's really great to see President Biden going back and playing a leadership role, which the United States obviously should be playing a leadership role. We've We've actually done a lot of the emissions that are, have, have um, brought us to this place. And so we should be at the forefront of figuring out how we turn it around. So it's, it's great to have a president who takes climate change, climate change seriously um, and wants to be um, at the forefront of shifting it. There's still more work to be done in Washington. Um, you know, there's, it would be great if we could get to all of our leadership on, on both sides of the aisle, really getting clear about this. Um, but I think obviously we are making progress from where we have been um, over the previous four years. Well, um, I want to talk a little bit about your website because I found it really helpful. It was really informative. Um, but on your website, uh, and we will put that site up on the screen here below, you encourage and invite people to share their stories of resilience and neighbors helping neighbors. Um, you must find these inspiring. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of times people think of climate change and they think it's a scientific thing. And, and obviously the data is important. I'm not discounting. Um, we need the contributions of the scientific community to help us understand the situation that we're in and what we need to do. But for years, the scientists have been warning us and it's been hard to get people to actually take it seriously. And that's because I think this is, there's, a, there's a fundamental sort of social and spiritual um, element to this. Um, where what we're being asked to do is really change our society in some deep ways to, to function from a different set of assumptions about how we need to live. And that's, that's about our story. That's about who we want to be, um, who we hope to be, what we think is possible. And so I, I'm really thankful, you know, it, the communications team and our engagement team really getting clear that we need to invite people in to share the ways that they're struggling, um, the real effects that climate change is having on their lives, but also to share the hope of what they're doing, what they hope for, um, what is possible. Um, because climate change can be a little depressing sometimes <laughs> when, you, when you look at the numbers. Um, but I believe, and I think there's a lot of folks out there that, that believe we do have what it takes to match this moment. And we need um, to all be inspired by each other's work and each other's actions um, so that each of us can, can go deeper and, and work harder uh, for the future that we all hope for and deserve. Well, Reverend, you were born and raised in Boston, as you said, and, and you were young when you were very active in the community. In high school, you were a peer health educator. You were also involved with Project uh, Hip Hop, where, which focused on teaching the history of the civil rights movement. And then after college, you actually became the director of that same organization. So please share with us, if you can, um, how did you become so engaged at such a young age and how are we to motivate our young people today? Yeah. So I would say, you know, a lot of it was that I grew up in a family and in a church community. I was a, a I sang in the church choir called the Angels Without Wings. I remember that. Um, <laughs> Good name. And, you know, I had this whole community of folks and, you know, my parents were among the early students of color, black students to be admitted to a lot of the universities here. And they were in those first classes where there weren't that many of them. And, um, and so our church community was really a people from really around the country, but who had a sense um, that God had opened doors for them 
um, to have the opportunities that they had. And they passed that on to us that, you know, they had fought to be able to be where they were and they were fighting to open more doors for us. And so I've always had a deep sense of civic responsibility. I was a little girl when um, Rosa Parks came to visit our our preschool and we reenacted the bus boycott for her. Um, and later on, I realized, I was like, she knows what happened. I don't know who we had to do that for her, but. <laughs> but it was good um, for you. It was good for you. And it your, was, yeah. Your- and so I think that that since that, um, the generation ab- above me had done so much to make my life possible, to give me opportunities that they didn't have. And, you know, my work at Project Hip Hop and, you know, what I continue to do is that's what I owe to the young people that are alive today. And I don't know if I have to do that much to encourage them. I've been out, I mean, they, they have uh, been out in the streets. I don't think we'd be having the conversation we are having around climate if it were not for the activism of young people. For them leaving schools, taking to the streets, saying this is our future and we need you adults to grow up and get, get it together. So um, I do try to do what I can to talk with young people, to share my own story. Um, but I think it is often less me um, having to give them the passion, but me sort of saying, what can I do to open the doors for you? Um, how can I, the same way that... Uh, the generation before me um, made it very clear that they were living and doing what they did so I could have opportunities. How do I do that same thing for the next generation of young people? And I, I do think about that pretty often. You know, we are excited. We're in the process of, of um, we'll be interviewing young people to come work here and shadow in our department. Um, I'm so excited um, that we're going to be doing that because I think that they're going to bring energy and ideas um and and so i i think uh this is the natural order of things you your young people the young people in society give us hope and they push us to be better um and so i'm really thankful that young people have done that around climate um and um just want to keep creating the space um for them um, to find their calling for them to create the innovations that don't even exist now, but um, they're starting to imagine them. Somebody is in a chemistry class right now, beginning to get the idea for some invention that that they're going to make. Some young people are hanging out after school today and starting to say, you know, we should do a, a, a rally around this. Um, so, you know, we just need to make sure that we're not putting up barriers for them uh, to live that out. So we all have a part to play. And in fact, it's a part that we all must play. So thank you so much, Reverend Mariama White Hammond. It was a pleasure speaking with you today. And I know there's much more to discuss down the road, but I wish you and your uh, multifaceted department so much luck. And uh, thanks for all the hard work that you all do there. Thank you. And thank you, our viewers, for watching. Climate change and worries about the future of our environment can be perplexing. Please take the time to go to this department's website. On it, you'll find inspiring information. There is a hopeful future for our land. That is, if we all do our part. Take care of yourselves and each other, and we'll see you next time on Commissioner's Corner. 